Welcome, welcome to the Talking Transformation podcast presented to you from the Western Cape Pod Bunker located here in the heart of Cape Town, South Africa. This pod is presented to provide a platform and a voice for built environment professionals and interest groups who are working towards transforming the places and spaces here in South Africa. It is dedicated to those individuals and community groups that are supporting both the formal and informal processes that are shaping our cities and our spaces. In today's episode of the Talking Transformation podcast, we revisit a theme which has occurred on a number of occasions in previous episodes. The whole question of the fourth industrial revolution, or 4IR as it seems to be understood, smart cities, digital cities, the whole question of taking our cities and towns into a next generation, a generation based on information technology, systems and analytics that really take us to a next level of optimization and efficiency within different city administrations. Administrations. The issue has already come up in one of our episodes where we looked at the state president's uh, State of the Nation address a few months ago and the whole question of a new city to be based around the idea of 4IR. We also started to touch on it in the episode where we looked at mobility and the different platforms that are available to assist people to get from point A to B in the most efficient manner possible, whether it be through public transportation or some of the e-hailing platforms. Today we're joined by Associate Professor Nancy Odendahl and Luke Boyle, both of whom are working out at the University of Cape Town, and they're our guests who are going to take us on a journey as to understand what is this concept of 4IR, how do we go about it, what is the infrastructure that's required, and what are some of the limitations that are associated with this. How do things like the Fourth Industrial Revolution and Smart Cities start to address some of the more pertinent issues within our towns and cities, like informality, informal economy, Economy, informal accommodation and the like. Their insights and reflections based on the research that they've been doing both collaboratively and individually makes for very compelling and interesting listening. We hope you enjoy the show and find benefit in the wisdom and the reflections from both Nancy and Luke. Enjoy the episode. So it's a Wednesday afternoon and I'm joined here in the CBD of Cape Town with Professor Nancy Urendahl and Luke Boyle, both working out of the University of Cape Town, but within different organisations. W- welcome this afternoon. Please tell us a bit about where you're working at the moment, uh, Nancy. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I'm Nancy Urendahl, as you know, and I'm at the School of Architecture, Planning and Geomatics. I teach in city planning. I'm Luke Boyle and I'm a researcher at the Urban Real Estate Research Unit at the Construction Economics and Management Department at the University of Cape Town. That's the Ureru team, right? That's correct, yeah. Fantastic. Well, both to both of you, many thanks for making the time uh, this Wednesday afternoon to come and talk to us about this whole concept of smart cities, fourth industrial revolution, uh, digital cities. All these words seem to be getting thrown around left, right and centre. And as somebody who sort of works with cities, I, I find myself thinking, well, do I have the first understanding of what these concepts are? What are they? Why are they important? Who is it serving and what is it making that uh, sort of better efficiency or speed in services? Today, that is the the, the topic of conversation. And maybe we should start by taking one of these uh, issues, the fourth industrial uh, revolution. President Ramaphosa, uh, in his State of the Nation address uh, a number of months ago, was talking about this idea of building a new city and the whole question of fourth industrial or 4IR, is that the correct uh, term, <laughs> was out there. We've done a podcast on, on the whole question of the new city, but let's talk now about this element of fourth, of fourth industrial revolution as a starting point. Nancy, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I first want to say that the smart city idea is not new. It's been around for a while, but obviously the focus on the fourth industrial revolution is a commendable, I would say, and understandable focus on job creation, on looking at ways through which the the, the current um, technological sort of evolution in terms of big data, in terms of Internet of Things, how all of that could actually lead to a situation where we are able to generate jobs in a, a different kind of manufacturing. So there's, that's the one side of it. And then the other side of it is the actual smart city idea, which is a, is a more holistic concept. And the digital city, Luke, is that something different or is it in the same, same frame? So, I mean, there's, there's many different terms around you know, how fourth industrial evolution and technology affects urban or societies and how cities work. Um, and there's never really been a kind of a, a universal and a, a kind of acknowledged definition of what they are. But 
I think there is a distinction between the two in the sense that you've got a digital city which is a very much a focus on technology and, and kind of bringing in efficiencies to the city and improvements in the cities with those technological adoptions. Um, so if you look at um, your, your distributed sensors and your IoT and that kind of thing, that for me would be more around your, your digital space and digitizing how a city runs. It's, so essentially it's, it's more putting a digital lens or a digital layer over your kind of more traditional urban kind of governance in that, those models. A smart city for me is, is taking that a little bit further and it's more synonymous with looking at kind of technology that enables um, solutions. I like to use the analogy of, of technology or a digital city being technology looking for a solution and a smart city being a solutions that are enabled by technology. That, that's the way I kind of like to distinguish between the two. So it's, it's taking that idea of, of how, how we communicate and how we interact in a city and taking that one step further and how we can innovate, how we can bring people into these challenges and how we can pull our resources and our ideas into developing innovative solutions for a city. If I can add, I mean, the, the, the digital city idea kind of goes back to the early 2000s as well when it was used interchangeably with e-governance strategies. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is the time where there was a big emphasis on using online capacity and digital um, technologies to enable better communication and also to enable two-way communication between the public and between government. Right. So the early emphasis on e-governance was often sort of an emphasis, you know, it was often kind of termed the digital city and it also it also related to a lot of cities creating online presence, presences through sort of websites, e-services, yeah, e sort of etc. But I mean, I, I really like Luke's distinction between the two. I think the smart city, um, not everybody would define the smart city so holistically, but I do think the smart city is something more. Um, it's about, I think the smart city to a lot of people is, is about the future and it's about potential. Mm. And it's also about the relationship between digital capacity and other infrastructures, which is really important for city management. At the point that you're making, Nancy, is that this, this, this is not something that's new. It's decades old. So where in the world uh, would, would you say are the, are the leaders, the global leaders in the thinking around uh, the whole question of the smart city? What are we learning as South Africa within our different cities? So where do we start? Who, who are the pioneers, pioneering cities in this, in this regard? There are, there are a number of sort of poster children, you know, there's um, Amsterdam is a big one, which, which everybody tends to talk about. And what's interesting about Amsterdam is that they're now turning the corner where they're becoming quite self-critical about their smart city and, and the kind of limitations of the smart city. And, you know, the essentially often defined as throwing a solution at a problem that doesn't exist. You know, mm -hmm. so if you if you have the technology, essentially using it for procedures or city kind of management procedures that don't aren't necessarily um, don't require such a sophisticated solution. And then there's there's Songdo in 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 in, Korea, in South Korea, which is actually which is actually seen as a smart city failure <laughs> because it it doesn't. I mean, the critique of it is that it's essentially. I mean, that is a city that was built from scratch. Um, with a kind of technological underpinning, I guess. So it had the um, infrastructure. It had the, it it had, had the it had infrastructure the from the way go. From Absolutely, and it's got the it's got the green buildings, and it's got the kind of waste solutions using smart technologies, etc. And it, it's impressive, but a lot of the writing about Songdo is the fact that it's just not a real city. It's not a, you know, you don't see people on the streets. It's you know, this I think there's a big difference between the digital city and the smart city, which is so eloquently explored by Luke. But there's also smart urbanism which speaks more to livelihoods and lifestyles. And to me, that's really exciting. So, I mean, you're bringing in a couple of concepts there. Mm. The whole thing of maturity, you're saying that Amsterdam's mm. already sort of hit that mm. peak and is now looking back at saying, mm. how, how can we improve? How mm. do we, you know, mm. what are some of the issues? And at the same time, the whole question of, it's no good having all this tech and uh, digital age without having a sense of place and a sense mm. of, of, mm. Of, inc of inclusivity within mm. the person or the people, the citizenry. Yeah. Any other thoughts from your side, Luke, in terms of the, you know, we've talked about Amsterdam and there's a South Korean example, anywhere else? Well, I know that India is it's the, the 100 Smart Cities program they've got there. Um, and then there's also Singapore, which I think there was a, a recent index that came out and I mean, I, I'm not a massive fan of this idea of ratings and indices, but uh, Singapore rated the, the most smart city in the world at the moment. And there's a few uh, Scandinavian countries that are involved there. 
But um, I think Nancy mentioned something important there about you know technology for technology's sake, and I think particularly in our context here, and I think that's something that we really need to ram home within the context of Africa and South Africa, and when we're talking about smart urbanism and smart cities, is that looking at what's appropriate for our context and looking at these solutions and how does tech enable solutions that are appropriate for what we need. Do we need you know a ticketing machine that that you know sorts out all the the traffic issues and a problem? Sure, it'll help. But is, is that essentially what is at the core of the issues of our cities? And, and do we strategically look at these things over other things that might be more important? What are the implications of cities in South Africa or Southern Africa not embracing the opportunities and the technology? What does that mean in terms of a future economy, a future lifestyle and other issues? Well, I suppose, I mean, whether we like it or not, we're living in an increasingly digitized world. And there's a massive opportunity lost if we don't start embracing these technologies and trying to figure out ways that we can kind of harness these to to tackle some of our own issues without necessarily just transplanting other people's ideas into our own context. Also, if, if, if as a city council, as a city government, you do not embrace the smart city idea, I can guarantee you that IBM or Cisco <laughs> or Siemens will be knocking on your municipal manager's door and suggesting that you do. These, these big multinational companies um, that used to be essentially focused on producing, well, I don't know, computers, yeah. I guess, <laughs> and, <laughs> and computer hardware, have now and uh, cell phones have now kind of moved into the city governance space. Yeah, yeah, we seem we seem to be seeing a lot of the, uh, some mm-hmm. of the, the corporates we're seeing increasingly getting involved in that sort of government space and, and governance mm. uh, space. Within the African context, are there any potential leaders, or are we seeing what have we seen in recent times of of cities in Africa that have taken the lead from some of those pioneers that you've talked about just now? Kigali is promoting itself as a big smart city, and Nairobi is also pushing for a smart city idea in the form of essentially a new town or a new satellite suburb on its on its <coughs> outskirts. But the one that def- definitely comes to mind is Kigali. The smart city narrative, the visual narrative, of, is often used to promote satellite cities yeah. or gated communities or, you know, so we mustn't forget that these ideas often get used for other purposes and property speculation, essentially. Yeah. But Kigali does come to mind as a... As a yeah, there's actually um, a research project that me and Francois have really at the UAE are, are looking to actually look at and Vanessa Watson has done some work mm. on it too about mm. how we label these things and it can be quite problematic because these concepts do get appropriated for you know as, as you mm. said property speculation mm. and the, we've kind of mapped some of these things like the Eco Atlantic in um, Lagos. in Lagos yeah which is I mean essentially one or two buildings have gone up in this this whole massive redevelopment project and we need to be really need to be careful about how we label these things and how these these concepts get appropriated and used or misused. So just putting broadband infrastructure in as part of the deal does not here make an eco estate. Is that what I'm hearing <laughs> uh, you say? Luke? Not in not in not in my understanding of the concepts. No. But you, well, well, I, I, I guess the other thing is that particularly with the economy, the way it is, people will be saying, "Look, this is potentially a next uh, Silicon Valley, given the you know the the, the, the blue chip that we can attract mm-hmm. here if we start." And I and I got started to get the impression from the president's. Uh, speech there at the State of the Nation that maybe he was punting at something along those lines of saying, "Look, if the if the economy is going this way, the technology is mm. taking us a particular way. When or if we build this new city, it has to be part of the the underlying mm. thinking, design, architecture, etc." And Luke? I, I think I think you know I think that's why Ramaphosa got a lot of criticism about this, and it's this idea of if you if you put in infrastructure, it'll come, but. You know, if you think about someone like Silicon Valley, it, it didn't develop because they decided this is going to be Silicon Valley and they'll put in infrastructure. It was actually this organic thing. There was a critical mass of very specific skills centered in, a, in an agglomerated in a specific area, which then built up from that. And this idea of, oh, we can just build a new city, we can put in, we can put in digital infrastructure, and then there we go, we'll have a smart city. It's a little bit short-sighted and flawed. What's quite interesting, though, is early smart city ideas in South Africa that emerged in the early 2000s. So I did some work then on um, Etiquini and on, on Cape Town as well, actually. Um, the early ideas were very much wedded to this idea if you have a, a broadband backbone. Mm-hmm. And then from that, you can start leveraging um, last minute access to communities. Mm-hmm. So in the South African context, actually, the smart city idea has been very developmental. Mm-hmm. So to hear the president speak about what is essentially this very glamorous, glossy, mm-hmm. um, new town idea of smart cities, frankly, it worries me. Mm-hmm. And it worries me that it might be appropriated for developing, you know, sort of mega suburbs that are in the middle of nowhere, that 
that actually are quite damaging to kind of, well, our undermining of spatial transformation, frankly. It's an interesting moment for us with regard to smart cities in, in, in the South African context. Typically, when we talk about cities and city infrastructure, we talk about roads, we talk about uh, water, sanitation networks, electricity. The whole question, though, I think more and more is around how do we understand that sort of broadband backbone and the availability of data, which starts to open up all sorts of opportunities, whether it's in entrepreneurship, whether it's around education. Maybe, Luke, your thoughts on this whole question of that, you know, this, is, this is now being seen in certain parts of the world if I'm not mistaken, as you know, essential uh, human right, the idea of access to communication and data. Well, yeah, I, I certainly see it that way. I think we, we under, underestimate the value of what something like access to connectivity really can offer people in terms of social mobility and that sort of thing. And if you think about you know, your most impoverished communities, these are the most vulnerable people in our society, and they have the, the most to give, or they're the most incentivized to, to be innovative. And, you know, Technology and, and or digital infrastructure and connectivity really provides a tool to be able to kind of unlock those innovations, I think. It also provides a, an opportunity for communities to essentially check up on the state. So what <laughs> you're starting to get um, in, in, in Cape Town in particular with the Social Justice Coalition mm -hmm. and also with the Violence Prevention Through Urban Upgrading Project is the use of cell phone technology to monitor the maintenance of, for example, toilet blocks. And then feed that Very information, yeah. geo, you know, geo map geo tag it, and, geo -tag it mm -hmm. and then feed that information back to this, the city sort of um, maintenance regime, mm -hmm. and you know, and thereby sort of, I guess what that means is you're starting to get sort of bottom up inputs it's and, like that and two -way, feedback loops. That two -way feedback that you and I, I think that's exciting. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm sure there's many folks in the city council that don't feel <laughs> it's that exciting. That found it quite difficult to process. But I think that. That may speak to a, a form of governance where you really do have those feedback loops that are important to ensure that you actually deliver on your promises to the poorest of the poor. So, I mean, here's an interesting concept. You're talking about the, you know, the big brother, it works two ways. <laughs> you say, Luke, it, it works both ways. Big brother as a government potentially looking at us and uh, the, the community is looking back with a mirror and saying, what's, what's going on? Here? I also feel that that might be some reason why there's a little bit of a hesitancy for, for cities in, in this context to really kind of take that extra, extra leap. Because there's a certain level of scrutiny that you open yourself up to when you start to engage and you start to react to these two-way conversations. Yeah. But I think there's great potential for bulk infrastructure to, to use digital technologies or smart technologies to manage bulk infrastructure. Um, with regard to smart grids and also water management. You know, everything produces data these days. Sure. So you're able to not only monitor what goes on um, you know, in sort of your, your sort of poorer areas and informal areas, but you're also able to monitor households in your sort of medium to high income areas around um, water use and, and, and energy use. And I guess that's the smart dream, mm. is that well-oiled machine where all the data just kind of runs and you're able to make decisions on the fly and you're able to kind of check your dashboards and know exactly how well the city is doing with regard to um, infrastructure maintenance and management. So, I mean, I don't think we, you know, I don't think we should forget that aspect of smart. I mean, that is the glamorous mm. stuff, but it's actually really useful. <laughs> in, in talking about optimization of networks, and when, when you say smart grids, I'm assuming that's the ability to, to, to look at uh, numerically and analyze the grid, yeah. whether it's electricity, water, very quickly. Is that correct? And also alter your currents kind of concurrently. Oh, oh, so yeah. even, even on an operational basis? Operational basis, you, you can actually do that, yeah. I mean, what was interesting last year uh, here in Cape Town with the, the drought, we started to see that on a different scale where you could almost look at your neighbor or your neighborhood mm -hmm. yep. and look at the water consumption and mm -hmm. almost that self-governance of saying, well, yeah. Luke, why are you using more yeah. water than, than you should? I, I, and I, I quite like that example that you just brought up because if you think about the water crisis, and, and a lot of people talk about, oh, we need smart water sensors and things like that. But I thought the city, what the city did was very smart. You know, instead of, well, we can, we can start investing in these, these smart water sensors and cut people up. Or we could use kind of social media and we can actually educate people and we can tell people how they can save water. And we actually, we, we managed to kind of avert a crisis by the amount of water we managed to save. And it wasn't necessarily a technological solution that was put forward, but, but it was enabled by technology in terms of, you know, social media. We can use the GIS platforms that the city has mm -hmm. to target where people are overusing their water. With a strong communication uh, message exactly. and, 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 and strategy. Mm -hmm. I think we might be moving more towards a hybrid city rather than a smart city. 
you know, where we utilize old fashioned technologies and, um, and kind of smart innovations together mm -hmm. to, to come up with, yeah, with bespoke solutions to, to some really sticky problems. And to me, that's really exciting. Mm. It does indicate a move away from thinking of the smart city as this kind of city in a box idea. This idea of a hackathon and how the hackathons can start to support whether it's a particular social service or take data, big data, and try and make sense of that within a sort of app-based technology. Is that something you might want to reflect on? Yeah, I, I've, I've just supervised a student who wrote a little bit about this. And I think what, what, what he found was that there's great potential to make open data available more broadly and then use hackathons as, mm -hmm. as, a, as a kind of strategy to make that data available and to explore ways in which that data can be used to come up with innovative solutions that could then be again used by the city or used outside the city in the corporate world. So I guess hackathons are... I mean, if we're going to talk about it from a city governance perspective, it's a really useful collaboration, co-production type strategy, I think. Um, and we're probably going to see more of it in the future. And I think what it, it also highlights is, is, is the importance of digital skills and how, what role they play in terms of, of smart city development and this idea of a smart citizen. You know, we have these solutions and they don't necessarily just seamlessly adopted by your citizenry. You need, you know, you need to have the skills and, and the access to be able to really tap into that and, and create that two-way communication. It's interesting because even, I mean, one of the, I think one of the more successful um, smart city projects that's been around for quite a while now is Smart Cape. I mean, making, mm. making digital, you know, yeah. making online facilities available in libraries. And it, 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 it may sound like a very simple solution to a couple of very simple problems. Mm -hmm. But even in that experience, and I've done some interviews on this, you know, people have reflected, people from the city of Cape Town reflected on it's all very well to make that available in libraries. But how do you equip people with the skills to use the Internet? Exactly, yeah. You know, in terms of um, age divides, digital divide issues. I think it's probably less of a problem these days because people have access to smartphones more ubiquitously. Mm -hmm. But I think it's it's exactly the same principle, yeah. right? It's the, sm the smartphone has taken away the left click, right click of the mouse, right? <laughs> <laughs> but even a smartphone has its limitations. You know, you mm. can't you can't code on a smartphone, mm. and there's things that you know it has yeah. limitations. And also, you know, if you think about some certain parts of Cape Town, for instance, the smartphone penetration isn't great. And you know, there's talk about having a citizen app. But if, if your citizenry don't have access to a smartphone, then there's, you know, there's limited means in which you can communicate with your citizenry with, if, if they don't have smartphones. And, and data expense. Exactly, yeah. So, so when we let, let, let's talk, this is being, turning into a very interesting part of the conversation, the whole question of what is the infrastructure, what is needed to be a smart city? You've already, look. you're talking about data costs, you're talking about educational elements of, you know, you need somebody to be able to, to actually actively be able to engage as a citizen. So what, is, what, is, what are the other elements uh, that go with this idea of saying, we want to be a smart city, yeah. we want to be looking forward, how, how? What are the prerequisites for that? So, f so for me, I, I think it's it's kind of it's quite a complex and layered issue. So it's not just a, a, a matter of, of digital infrastructure. But there's also there's there's that kind of educational layer on top of that, and then there's the not having access to the connectivity, but there's also having access to the technology. Mm. So a, a laptop or a computer or a smartphone. You know, th there's limitations that you can have with these devices, and and it's 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 about tackling all three. But I think. Fundamentally, it's it's that infrastructure in terms of a smart city. It's it's, I view it as almost the base of your your smart city pyramid. Everything can then start building up on top of that. Not just from that operational perspective, but also from the way you want to engage with your citizens. I think Luke des described it very well. I would also add to that perhaps an open data platform of sorts yep. that does, you know, that is mm -hmm. well maintained, that is well marketed, that is. Um, and that is available to people to use to kind of towards, you know, businesses, creating yeah. new businesses or e-commerce ventures, et cetera. I think yeah. there's great potential there. And I think I think that's a really great point you just raised, because if you think about digital, um, the city of Cape Town has tried to implement some, or has implemented something like this um, with the, the open data portal. And it hasn't received a great response because I think people have access to it, but you also, you know, you need to have the skills. I've been on it myself and I don't necessarily have the skills to really be unlock, unlock the potential of that. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, I'm, without sounding too arrogant, I'm, I'm probably on the, the upper scale of, of the kind of in terms of digital skills. If, if someone isn't there, then how are they going to engage in that? 
You've alluded to Smart Cape as one initiative, and I see that as a, a sort of partnership. So the question of leadership and partnerships within mm. government, yep. I mean, I would also sort of imagine that's fairly fundamental to saying, Absolutely. you know, taking us forward. Maybe you have some mm. thoughts on that. I mean, what's really, what's, what's really quite funny is that a lot of the multinationals, a lot of the big companies like IBM that push for smart city strategies that they would then, you know, sort of uh, manage, <laughs> a lot of the marketing language speaks about, you know, joined up governance you know, the stuff we talk about when we talk about IDPs and um, working across silos and how a smart city enables you to do that quite, you know, in a very fluid manner. And the, and the, and the great irony is I think a lot of times the reason smart city strategies often don't work to the extent that they could is because for exactly that reason, that people work in silos and that, you know, the folks working in IT are not fo- talking to the folks working on the SDF and et cetera, et cetera, you know. And it's like not a new problem yeah. um, and it's not going dis- to disappear because you now have great internet mm-hmm. or um, great data and open data yeah. for a platform, etc. And, and I think that alludes to the point that I've kind of started to uncover in this research that I've been doing. It's that you can't have a smart city without a smart city in the sense that you're, you need to have that institutional kind of dynamics and that those mechanisms in place to really be able to unlock these things. And, and that is, in technology aside, a city needs that regardless. And I think, you know, we need to really start looking at these aspects of, of urban governance before we can really start to, to look to technology to really unlock, you know, those, those amazing potentials that they offer. Smart technologies are not going to solve your institutional issues. Exactly, yeah. Well, let's move on to some of those limitations. Let's <laughs> let's say I'm sold. I'm sold on the idea. We want to be smart. We want to be progressive, digital, all those. But there has to be limitations. And again, if I think of some of the challenges that are facing our towns and cities here in, in South Africa and many of the developing cities across the world, we think about rapid, info, rapid rate of urbanization, informality, major levels of displacement and marginal uh, communities. So there has to be a limitation to all of this. And um, I, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on what what those limitations might be, or am I seeing it too too small? And maybe there are approaches to informality, uh, to the econ- informal economy and so forth, that could well be supported by that. But I'm asking the question. I think the limitations are quite often where you do have uh, sort of smart suburbs or smart developments being promoted. I'm thinking specifically of the India um, 100 Smart City campaign. It often does have kind of social socioeconomic fallout in terms of communities being moved to make way for new smart cities. And again, it's not a new problem. It's just under a new name. I do think quite often these initiatives get implemented without the necessary skills base to support it. Absolutely, yeah. And I do think you need political leadership. If I'm not mistaken, Luke, this is one of the big findings from your work, is you need political leadership and you need vision to implement a smart city strategy properly. And yet at the same time, I I would argue that one big smart city vision is not necessarily the way to go either. Mm. I think if you're going to go for a smart city strategy as a city administration, you need something that is a little bit more fine, finely grained, that is a bit more contextually embedded. That's, yeah. that's, that that's fine-tuned to, to the needs. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. speaks to needs and, yeah. and, 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 and priorities. Mm-hmm. And I know I sound like a city planner when I say that, but... You, <laughs> you're, you're allowed. <laughs> I'm allowed. It's my job. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that, would be, that would be how I would start to answer that question. But I'm sure Luke has got some greater thoughts as well. Yeah, well, I, I think, yeah, I think Nancy hit the nail on the head in terms of leadership. I think if we look across Africa, a lot of the, the smart interventions that are, are implemented, they're quite often disjointed and lack a level of coherency. And I think that, that ultimately comes back yeah. to the leadership. And you really need to, I, I think for me, you need to really have a, a good sense of what your issues are and, and, and kind of realistic mechanisms of how you're going to start to, to solve those issues mm. before you start really looking at your smart city interventions. And, and that requires leadership, and it re- also requires a capable institution to drive that. Luke, I mean, in recent, in recent months, you've, uh, you've been party to uh, the publication of, I think it was your second report, on some of the work that the city of Cape Town has been doing in relation to their digital and smart uh, city uh, strategy. Maybe just a quick overview on the work that you've done there and, and what the findings of that were. I know it's only halfway through, you've yep. got two more reports to come, but just some initial thoughts on what you found there as a, as a case study within South Africa. Sure. So, yeah, so I looked at Cape Town um, my kind of field is, is more in the urban management space, and I thought, well, you know, there's this 4, four IR that's 
you know this this buzzword that's starting to generate a lot of interest and, and political leverage has been kind of taken up on this. And I thought, well, what's what's going on in Africa? What we if I couldn't find much research in terms of what was actually happening on the ground. Uh, so I started exploring Cape Town, and I, and I started to uncover there's actually a great deal that's been happening. So I thought, well, this is this is a great opportunity to, to do some some interesting research, and it kind of just snowballed from there. So yeah, there's four reports that we're going to be putting out uh, at the Urban Real Estate Research Unit. So the first two are out. The first one just this kind of um, just an overview of what, what's mm -hmm. going on, what the the digital city strategy that that's in place for the city of Cape Town. And the second report was on the current state and characteristics of the city of Cape Town's implementation of the strategy that they have. Going forward, um, in the next few weeks, I hope to be putting out the next report, which will be looking at the, the various opportunities and challenges that exist for the city of Cape Town as they kind of continue on this journey. And then finally, I'll kind of look at a way forward for the city of Cape Town and then kind of tie it all together and distill into something more, that is more applicable, more broadly and generally to, to Africa and South Africa and how can we use this research and to, to kind of add some value and insight to how we can think about smart urbanism in an African context. I'm very impressed by, by what the city of Cape Town is doing, I think, in terms of meaningfully adopting, I think Nancy would probably back me up on this, in terms of meaningfully adopting a, a smart city and a more comprehensive smart city strategy, the city's done some pretty great things. I feel like they're at a bit of crossroads now where they need to kind of take that next leap, which would be more kind of opening up in terms of that open data platform, that open platform of collaboration, which there seems to be some hesitation around. But they are doing some amazing things, and yeah. If I think the both of you sort of based there at the University of Cape Town, up the, up the road, the campus there, uh, if, if I think the two biggest institutions, arguably, in Cape Town, it would be the city yeah. and the University of Cape Town. Yeah. And I guess if, you know, the partnerships, and we talked about partnership being uh, important, how, how do you see is potentially, is there a, a, a vehicle to, to see a stronger alliance between those two mega organizations coming together to, to play in that space? I, I think there's great potential for collaboration on working on, you know, what a smart city can deliver and what it could be and what smart urbanism could be. If I could start with the topic of smart urbanism, you know, basically how digital technologies are um, appropriated by communities, by individuals in terms of their livelihoods and their lifestyles. I think obviously doing research on these topics is really meaningful and um, sharing that research and getting feedback on that. But I think what you mean by partnership is something quite different, obviously. And there's a, there's a, there is a futures think tank that's being driven by our vice chancellor, which I think will no doubt provide an opportunity to work um, not only with the city of Cape Town, but also with other universities and also with province around kind of thinking what, you know, what the futures, what these various futures are going to be and what does the, and for me and for, for, for Luke as well, you know, what this, this sort mm. of city's role and all of that will be. So I think, yeah, I think there's great opportunities out there, but I do think that it still needs a, a kind of critical lens and it needs a critical perspective if we can... And that localised lens that you talked that about, that's context-specific. Context yeah. Exactly, yeah. And I just want to support Luke in saying that I think the city of Cape Town's doing some really exciting stuff. And I think it hasn't fallen into the trap of just adopting the discourse without thinking about it critically. Yeah, I mean, exactly. It's, um, it's really, I mean, in the early days, in the early 2000s, the city of Cape Town was one of the first city administrations that I know of that did a dig digital divide study, trying to understand what the kind of, you know, the, the, the complexities are with regard to um, digital access in, in the city of Cape Town. And it was that long ago. Yeah. And then, I mean, if you think about it, as early as 2000 was the implementation of the, the inter enterprise resource planning uh, system, which was the, I can't remember which, which vendor it was now, but I mean, at the time, it was the largest municipal implementation of ERP platform. And that's, that's created the digital backbone for the city to, to run now, what, 20 years later. And at the time when it was developed, it wasn't, even, it wasn't necessarily even in terms of Africa pioneering, it was globally pioneering, mm -hmm. which I think you know, we need to really celebrate the, those innovations and the fact that we are leading in certain aspects. And we've, you know, we had some really strong leadership that drove that and a lot of political will behind that. I mean, the little bit I know about it is that it certainly provided, that initiative provided sort of sit continuity amongst officials during very politically turbulent times. Well, <laughs> you know? sure. I mean, there's nothing like a, a big project like that to bring people around a table. And maybe sure. that brings us back to the topic of partnership. partnership, yeah. partnership. Yeah. Yeah. Seems and, to be and bipartisan partnerships. Mm, mm, Sounds exactly. like a common, common theme and uh, clearly that's where we seem to be going. Mm. So as we start to work towards a, su a summary of, of the uh, the discussions, 
what is it that you're busy with now, Nancy? What is it that you're trying to pull together from your research at the moment on this topic? Sure. Um, so I'm working on two projects at the moment that relate to this. The one is a book project where I'm working with a colleague from the University of Plymouth, and he's an urban design architect. And what we're interested in is how smart technologies can enhance a sense of place in cities. So we've um, it's an edited book and we've got a whole bunch of people from across the world doing chapters on different contexts and how smart technologies can enhance the sense of place and we have folks from VPUU working, uh, sort of writing about Cape Town and about the work that VPUU is doing in Kailicha, um for that. So that's the one project I'm really excited about. And then the other project I'm working on is a collaboration with the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland and with a colleague from um, University College London and also a colleague from Singapore National University where we're looking at a comparative project looking at the smart city experience in India versus South Africa. Fascinating. And we're going to see that published in the next year or so? Definitely. Fantastic. Luke, from your side? Yeah, so I mean, just I'm wanting to round up this this kind of Euro report series and then yeah, me and Nancy are hoping to collaborate on some stuff, mm-hmm. looking maybe around innovation in, in public sector and how, how that kind of develops and how that takes root in terms of smart city innovations. And then yeah, I think that for now that's, that's on my agenda. Well, good luck in concluding that side yeah, of it. Thank you. My summary, the points that I'm taking away from the discussion that the three of us have had is that this is clearly a conversation that goes broader than just the broadband and the broadband Absolutely. backbone or, yes, uh, definitely. Or, or or marketing the next Silicon Valley or mm. Silicon Eco Estate or whatever so we are. So much more than that. Um, <laughs> the whole question of partnerships has come through right from the beginning exactly. th- through to this yeah. this point now where we you, you, the two of you are talking about collaborating in future and pooling your f- uh, field of expertise. And the, 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 the fact that there is limitations. I think, you know, when we've talked about the informal uh, economy, the, that there may be limitations to what we can do and it's going to take another sort of lens and thinking to, to adapt that. And maybe that's something we can come back in, in six months, yeah. a year's time and say, have we thought about how we can be more proactive yeah. in some of these spaces, Luke? Well, I think I think it, to sum up, I think if there's one kind of thing that I'd like to leave out there in terms of a limitation is, is that you know, the a smart city development is only going to be for the elite unless we find a way to, to providing digital connectivity, access to technology at scale and, and affordability. I think until we unlock that, we really, we're really never really going to have a smart city. So on that note, to Professor Nancy Udendahl and Luke Boyle, many thanks for your time and thoughts today. We look forward to picking up the conversation in the near future. All the very best. Enjoy the rest of your week. Great. Thanks, Pete. Thank you so much, Pete. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Talking Transformation podcast. Please engage with us and let us know your thoughts on this episode. You can do so via the Anchor podcast platform. There's a voice message function available via the app. You can also follow us on Twitter via Talking Transfo and the number one. So Talking Transfo one. Our theme music is kindly made available by Tribal Need. Find out about the music, the street art shows here in Cape Town and Europe via tribalneed.com.